Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast. Hey there, everybody, and welcome back. Before we get into the episode, just want to let you know that this is the free version of the podcast, and all that means is that we are way behind where I'm at in Patreon. So if you are loving this podcast and you need more John Constantine in your life, definitely go check us out at patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books and sign up for the Hellblazer tier where you'll get access to the entire Hellblazer library that I've recorded so far, and also you'll get access to the exclusive episodes of the Planes, Trains, and Comic Books main podcast. So if any of that sounds good to you, definitely go over to patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, and sign up there. And with that out of the way, let's get into the issue. Today we are reading Hellblazer number 63, and just a little catch up on what's been going on. The first of the fallen is after John Constantine. He's been trying to figure out how to break the deal that he made with John uh, when John got him to cure his lung cancer. He was very slighted by that trick. And so he's been trying to figure out how to get around that. And in the last issue, we saw that the first is trying to mess with John by bringing out people from his past, specifically a man who had almost molested John when John was only 16 years old. So John had that traumatic incident with him, then didn't see him for 30 years. And then John just happens to see him walking in the present day, which really messes him up for a bit. But John goes to try to get revenge on the man. And when he does, he follows him to a church. He finds out that that man was actually a priest who was under the influence of the first of the fallen, which is why in the past, the man had been going around murdering and sexually molesting people. In long story short, the man ended up killing himself in the church that John was hearing his confession in. So now John knows that the first is even going back into his history and pulling trauma from back then in order to throw him off his game in the present. And that is where we left off on the last issue. So first things first with issue 63, we got the cover here. We see John Constantine is having a drink, having a smoke. He's looking like he's resting his arm on the bar and he's looking straight at us. And behind him, we see the apparitions of Swamp Thing and the Phantom Stranger. And as we turn to the first page, we see a very sad John Constantine. And we see the name of this issue is actually called 40. And it is written by Garth Ennis with art by Steve Dillon. And as we zoom out, we see John is just walking outside and his narration says, I hardly noticed the winter turning to spring. I'm drifting through the days and doing nothing, ignoring the magician's need to scrabble in the dark. It's not that I'm content. Bastards rule and winkers whine and burks bend over, cheeks spread wide. Sod it. I don't know. So the months shoot by and right now goes with them. And all I can think about is love and war to come. And then this morning, I noticed the date. So it seems like John is having an issue with living kind of the domestic life with Kit. So that's what he's thinking about as he's walking around. There's this impending doom, but he's also kind of not sure if he likes this domestic life or not. So John walks in off the street and he goes up some stairs up to Kit's apartment and he lets himself in. And when he does, he asks if Kit knows what day it is. And when he doesn't get an answer, he sees a note on the table that's addressed to him and he opens it and it says, John had to go home at short notice. My Aunt Jane's awfully sick. I'll try and get back tomorrow or the next day. Sorry, big lad. Love, Kit. And John stares at the note and says, bollocks. And then John thinks for a second, and he sits down, and he makes a call. And when someone picks up on the other line, he asks, is this the cabbie's answer to Oscar Wilde? And we see on the other end is Chaz, his friend, and Chaz is laughing, saying, piss off, John. What's the score? And John replies, well, I've just remembered something. It's, uh, it's me birthday. And Chaz says, you're joking. How old are you? And John answers, 40. And Chaz pokes fun saying, freaking hell, John Constantine the fogey. Can I give you all the shit then? Do you need a hand in the cassie then, granddad? And John laughs saying, Christ, are we on form? Anyway, look, you coming down the Red Rover? Kit's out of town like. And then we see in Chaz's office that Chaz's boss is telling him to freaking hurry up. And Chaz scowls at him. And then he answers John saying, Gotta keep it in your trousers tonight, huh? Sorry, mate. I can't. I'm on till six in the morning. And John gets kind of sad when he hears this and he says, Oh, come on, Chaz. It's my birthday. And Chaz looks pretty sad too. And he says, I'm sorry, like, but what can I do? You know what the missus is like. Give us a bell tomorrow, right? I've got to go. 
And then John hangs up the phone all sad, and he decides to go down to the corner shop and get supplies for his own party. And as he walks out, the narration says, bugger it. Since when did I ever have a happy birthday anyway? 40 years of knives in the back. That's all I've managed. 40 bloody years. So John walks into the corner shop, and he says to the cashier behind the counter, and he says to her, give us two bottles of Jack Daniels and 60 silk cut, Janie. And as Janie gets his orders, she says, not your usual, John. And John replies, I suppose not. And as she puts his order in the bag, she's just making conversation with him saying, here, you should have seen the bloke in before you. Six foot six, big as a bus. He bought 10 crates of tenant super, 10 bottles of Bushmills, and all this other stuff. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And as John takes his bottles and walks out, he says, glad someone's having a good time. And then as he walks out of the store, his narration says, how can I be 40 for crying out loud? Ah, shit. My life's nothing to celebrate. Is that why Kit's in Belfast? Why Chaz is snowed under? Because I'm meant to have a friggin' crap time of it? I got no other mates. Oh, I know people, but they twig there's something quite not right and keep their distance. They know what happens when you get too close. And as John's walking down the street thinking all this, of course, he sees people celebrating and drinking with their friends. And it's just putting him in a real sour mood. So he gets back to Kit's flat, and as he opens the door, he thinks, well, here we go. Get drunk, get maudlin, slide down. Bloody hell, I'm 40, all right. And then someone behind him yells, hey, Johnny, catch. And John looks like he's expecting it to be someone evil or something bad's gonna happen to him. But as he turns to see who it is, he sees a bunch of old friends that we've seen throughout the series are in his apartment and they threw him a surprise birthday party. So the people that we see that I can definitely identify is the Lord of the Dance is there. We see Ellie, the demon from the last story arc, and Nigel, his friend that helped him during the Royal Blood storyline. Then we see two people. I'm not 100% sure if they've been in it before, but there's like a priest looking guy and there's also like a biker dude. And the last person we see is a woman who, at first I didn't know who she was because she's always in an iconic costume usually, but we see Zatanna here who is from normal DC Comics, but we know from Alan Moore's Swamp Thing run that Zatanna and John have a romantic past, but I think now they're just friends. And John, when he sees them, is kind of confused and he says, what, what's this? And the biker guy says, it's your party, you stupid bastard. And the Lord of the Dance answers, You've plenty of friends, Johnny. You just have to know where to look for them. I did. And Chantinelli looks at John and says, Come on, John. You've got a reputation to live up to. And at that, John kind of gives an evil smile like he's agreeing to whatever's going to happen tonight. And he walks over to the Lord of the Dance with a bottle of Jack Daniels and he says, I haven't seen you since last Christmas. And you put this together? Screw me. This is freaking great. I thought I was in for one miserable bloody night. And the Lord of the Dance says, You can't be down all your life, Johnny. And then Nigel cuts in, uh, I mean, even I have to take a break from the war on capitalism every now and then. And John looks over at Nigel and says, bloody hell, it's Nigel Engels. Never thought I'd see you on me birthday, son. And Nigel says, yeah, well, you gave me a bit to think about with the royal thing. And then John kind of gets closer to Nigel and smiles and says, not just you, Nigel. Notice how he had some public trouble with the missus just after we finished? Possession leaves you with scars. I hear he got up to some well dodgy stuff in the bedroom and well... I'm not going to draw you a picture. And as Nigel walks away, the biker guy comes up to John and says, is that the Nigel Archer who wanted to do voodoo on Thatcher? And John laughs and says, yeah, that's him, Header. And then Chantinelli cuts in saying, bloody idiot. I mean, didn't he know who she had on her side? And John looks over at the biker guy and the priest and he says, don't be cruel, Ellie. It's a party, isn't it? How's life with you, Header? And Rick the Vic? And Header replies, I'm all right, Johnny. I'm sure this wee knave's up to no friggin' good, mind you. And then he puts his arm around Rick, the vicar, and Rick flips him off saying, may the Lord bless and keep you, Header. And then Rick turns to John and says, all is well with me, John. Thank you for asking. Oh, I recently located the banned literature you mentioned the last time we met in the Archbishop's collection. The usual price? And John smiles and says, for a foreskin Bible? Maybe. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to know what a foreskin Bible is. So John says that, he turns and he looks, and he sees a little rabbit sitting on a counter. And I don't think we've ever met this rabbit before, but John looks at him and says, what's up, Mange? And apparently, this is not a normal rabbit, this is a rabbit that talks. And he answers John saying, effin' shite, effin' irony, he said, puts me mind into the effin' rabbit off my stage act, like, irony. And then John walks over to him and he picks the rabbit up and the rabbit does not look very happy at all. This is a white rabbit who has very disheveled fur and he just has an angry scowl on his face the entire time he's talking. So John brings the rabbit up to his face and he says, 
You still do that trick where you pull a magician out of your hat? And the rabbit says, give me a hat and I'll effing show you. So now that we've had all the introductions of all the characters in this story, talking rabbits included, <laughs> obviously this night is going to get pretty crazy. And we cut to a little while later while John is like halfway down his bottle of Jack Daniels and the narration says, going to be one of those nights. It suits me. Three hours in and I'm pissed as a fart. Then we cut to John pissing in an alley and his narration says, Frig knows how I got out here. And then we see while he's peeing, he's singing a song. And of course, I will sing this as best as I can. I don't know this song. So here it goes. I stuck my finger in a woodpecker's hole. And the woodpecker said, God bless my soul. Take it out. Take it out. Remove it. And luckily for your ears and my embarrassment, he gets cut off by someone saying, John Constantine. And John turns around while still pissing. And he says, what? And as he turns, his stream of urine ends up on the shoes of the man who said his name. And as we turn the next page, we see that that man is in fact another DC character known as the Phantom Stranger. And the Phantom Stranger looks kind of mad and slided, possibly hurt. And he looks at John and he says, I had hoped we would ignore the cold facade that our kind deems so necessary, if only at this time of celebration. But I see there will be no hands clasped against this dark night. I see I must remain a stranger. And then before John can say anything, the Phantom Stranger disappears. So apparently the Phantom Stranger thinks John pissed on him on purpose. And as John stands there in the alley just holding his dick and still pissing, the narration says, Oh Christ, the poor bastard. All those years on his own and I... I... And then out loud, John says, Uh... <laughs> and then we cut to the inside of the party a little bit later when John gets back. And we see him pouring a bunch of drinks and the narration says... The others think it's pretty funny too. And we see Heather is saying to Zatanna, serves the pompous shite right, sleeker looking wanker. And Zatanna is saying to him, oh, you Brits, your sense of humor is so anal. And like I said before, Zatanna looks completely different than she normally does in DC. Normally she has her magician's outfit on, which is also her DC superhero costume. And that has like a black bustier with fishnet stockings. And she usually has long hair too, but now she's definitely more casual here. She's wearing an orange jumpsuit and her hair only goes just past her ears now. And because she didn't like the joke or she thought it was so dirty, the Lord of the Dance turns to her and says, Oh, Zatanna, imagine the look on his face. So those three are in the background talking. And then we see John mixing the drinks and Nigel looking at what he's mixing and says, What's that? And John replies, Rocket fuel. And John passes the glass to Nigel. And then he turns to Heather and says, I meant to ask you, do you know where Terry the Butcher is these days? And Heather says, Aye, I'll tell you where he is. He's at the bottom of Clyde with a baseball bat up his arse. I caught the wee figure in bed with my daughter, for Christ's sake. And then John pauses and looks kind of concerned, and he says, Maggie and Kate? Aren't they? And Heather answers, Siamese twins. Aye, Butcher's better off dead, mind. He pissed off Mike Adams last year and got his dick cut off. They left him an inch to pee with, though. And John replies sarcastically, Old Adams always was a big softy. Then we cut to some time later, and the narration says, The Witching Hour. And we're cutting into the middle of a conversation where John is talking to Rick the Vicar, and apparently he's making him a proposition. And he's saying, Two grand and a jar of angel spunk. Final offer. And in the foreground, we see Mange the Rabbit is eating some broccoli on a plate, and he's saying, Bastards! Bastards! All freaking bastards! And then the broccoli in front of him begins to sparkle, it looks like, or something's going on with it. And Mange the rabbit says, uh, Constantine, did you spike my freaking broccoli? And everybody turns to see what he's talking about. And then all of a sudden the broccoli begins to grow and sprout and Swamp Thing grows a body from the broccoli. And Swamp Thing hands out a letter to John and he says, what is the meaning of this? And John takes the letter and looks at it and he sees it is addressed to Mr. S. Thing, the Swamp. And whoever the postal employee was who found that address, good for them. Going above and beyond right there. And we see in the background as John is looking at the envelope that the Lord of the Dance looks kind of worried. And John sees the Lord of the Dance and he knows what happened. And he says, you invited him? Bloody hell, mate. And the Lord of the Dance replies, oh, come on. You two go back ages. And Swamp Thing is still confused and he looks pretty angry. And he says, invited to what? I am becoming impatient. And John turns to him, kind of looking just as mad, and says, Well, now you know how I feel, trying to talk to a bloke who speaks at sod all miles an hour. Grow some extra vocal cords, you burk. It's my birthday. And Swamp Thing looks surprised at that information, and he says, I did not know. 
I bear you no ill will as such. And then Swamp Thing turns away from John kind of awkwardly as John lights a cigarette and John says, oh, lucky old me. And then the Lord of the Dance says, shit, I'm sorry, lads. And then John walks over to Swamp Thing and says, all right, all right. Don't take the hump, Sprout. Bollocks, I've got this freaking magic idea. Then we cut to a panel where the rocket fuel drink that John made and gave to Nigel has taken effect and Nigel is piss drunk on the couch singing songs to himself. And John turns to Header saying, Header, take Nigel home and pick up his plant, will you? And as we turn the page, we see Header is now wearing a policeman's hat for some reason and Nigel looks pretty shaken up or sad, possibly. And we see on the counter is a weed plant in a pot and the pot has written on it, Nigel's hands off. So maybe that's why Nigel's sad because he thinks they're gonna smoke all his weed. And the narration says, they're gone 20 minutes. God knows where Header got his new hat, but I'll bet one little piggy's off to hospital. And we see Zatanna's kind of smiling and she's looking at the weed plant and she says, geez, Nige, Cheech and Chong eat your heart out. And from that reaction, you would think the weed plant is gigantic or something, but it's a little tiny baby plant. So her reaction is kind of funny. So John turns to Swamp Thing and he says, take it away, maestro. And Swamp Thing stretches out his hands and that weed plant grows gigantic on the table. And with extreme glee in his eyes, Nigel looks at the plant and says, Oh, tree beard, I knew you'd grow up one day. And Zatanna looks pretty impressed too. And Rick the Vicar is so moved by this, this growing of the plant that he's actually quoting scripture saying, And they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. Then John turns to Swamp Thing and he says, Cheers, you dry it out for us, yeah? And Swamp Thing replies, Yes, I must go now. My family needs my protection. And John replies, right. Well, look, for what it's worth, I'll try and leave you alone from now on, okay? And Swamp Thing looks down on John, unbelieving, and says, you are very drunk, Constantine. Goodbye. And then Swamp Thing's body vanishes, leaving only pieces of broccoli left on the floor. And then Header walks over to John and says, that him away? I'm telling you, if I had enough papers, I'd skin him up and smoke him. As we turn the page, we see that John is sitting on the couch with Nigel, and they both have rolling papers in their hands. And John's narration says, here we go. Shit, it's been bleeding ages. Apparently, John has not rolled a joint in a long time. And Nigel on the other couch is getting his papers ready, and he's talking to Zatanna, and he's kind of flirting with her, saying, I'm dead good at this, you know? It's the cardboard bit at the end that's the tricky bit. Apparently, they don't do that in America. And Zatanna says to him, no. So, how did you meet John, Nigel? And as Nigel begins to delicately roll his joint, he says, Well, our student union was haunted, right? This sociology student jumped out a window on acid, and then he came back. So Constantine showed up out of nowhere and said he could get rid of it. I thought he was going to do an exorcism. Thing was, he said it was the crappiest ghost he'd ever seen. He just walked up to it and said, piss off, and it did. And then Nigel looks down at his finished product of the joint that he's rolled, and it doesn't look quite right. It looks all lumpy and misshapen, and he says, always seem to screw it up at the end. I keep hearing about these huge ones you can do, but it sounds like a bit of a myth if you ask me. Then he looks over at John, who is just finishing rolling his joint, and John's joint is about a foot long, <laughs> and it looks perfectly shaped and ready to smoke. And as we turn the page, we see everybody is sitting on the couch, and they're all smoking weed, and the narration says, monumentally stoned. And Nigel is kind of freaking out. He's on the couch, and he's saying, oh God, Oh, I don't know if I can handle this. And Hatter stands up and he begins to walk to the kitchen saying, Oh, I? Well, I've got the munchie something shocking. And as Hatter enters the kitchen, we see Zatanna is sitting on the counter and she's super high. She's saying in one of her backwards spells speech, I'm out of my face. And then we see John and Ellie are sitting at the table next to her. And she says, huh, You seen the state of Nigel? Mr. Messy. Then Zatanna turns to John and says, Hey, What's the scoop on Kit, John? Looks like you finally met your match at last. And John's kind of surprised that she would ask about Kit because he and Zatanna used to date a little bit. And he says, bollocks. But Ellie doesn't let him off the hook and she says, oh, come on, it's over a year now. She must be something special, eh? And then John kind of smiles as he thinks about Kit to himself. And then the women give each other knowing glances. Then we turn the page and the narration says, six in the morning. And everybody is getting ready to leave John's apartment. They're all putting their jackets on and stuff. And Zatanna is talking to John saying, take care, you lunatic, please. And in the background, we see Nigel is talking to Chantinelli, who, if you remember, is a succubus demon. And he's saying, listen, I love you. You're beautiful. And Chantinelli says to him, you're playing with fire, little boy. 
And then John walks over to Rick the Vicar, Header, and Mange the Rabbit, and he says, Cheers, lads. I'll be in touch. And Rick says, Excellent, John. Header will no doubt be in a foul mood when England once again thrashed Scotland in the cup. But I always look forward to seeing you. And Header hears this and he says, Ah, away and throw shite at yourself. So they leave and then John walks over to Chantinelli as she's about to walk through the door. And she says to him, See you later, you sneaky sod. Are we going to sort this figure soon? And she's talking about the first there, I'm assuming. And John replies, Oh, yeah. Then Ellie leaves and we see as Nigel's walking to the door, John says, you be careful on your way home now, Nige. And Nigel says, yeah, no probs. You're not such a bad bastard, you know that? Not so bad. And then John pats him on the back. And as Nigel walks out the door, we see that John has put a sign on Nigel's back that says, all coppers are bastards. And John kind of chuckles to himself as Nigel walks out. Then John goes and sits on the couch. And we see the Lord of the Dance has not left yet. And the narration says, there comes a point at all the best parties where it's just two blokes and a bottle of whiskey. And we see John is kind of staring at his whiskey glass and the Lord of the Dance is sitting on the couch next to him saying, so what do you see in the whiskey, Johnny? And John replies, I see, I see, I see one god awful freaking hangover and half an hour's agony on the bog in the morning. And then he takes a big drink out of the glass and the Lord of the Dance says, it is the morning. Then he looks at John and says, tell me then, how does it feel to be 40? And John looks at him with a smirk and says, I'm off to a bloody weird start anyway. It doesn't feel that different. Just an easy way to mark off another stage, you know what I mean? Then he gets more thoughtful and continues. I've had one buggered up life so far, but bloody hell, at least it's been interesting like. Cheers for the party anyway. And the Lord of the Dance looks down bashfully and says, Ah, I told you I owed you one. It's good for you anyway. You need to let your guard down now and then, or you'd frig yourself up royally. Then they cheers to that, and the Lord of the Dance says, I know what you mean about your life, Johnny. I know you've made your share of mistakes. You're not perfect. You usually end up covered in blood and the shit kicked out of you. Pissed off at all the bastards with a power that you just can't touch. The Pogues wrote a song that could have been about you. You're a rake at the gates of hell. Then the Lord of the Dance gets even more serious and John sits back kind of depressed as the Lord of the Dance says, I may as well tell you, Johnny, you're in for a bloody rough couple of years. You've pissed off the last people you ever should have. And the Lord of the Dance begins to fade away, and as he does, he says, But I'll be there for you when the time comes, son. Be lucky. And the Lord of the Dance completely disappears and leaves John sitting on the couch drinking by himself. So John thinks about what the Lord of the Dance said, and then he takes a big gulp and finishes his glass of whiskey. Then we cut to the outside of the apartment where Kit is just arriving home, and she's saying, Bloody cabbies. John, are you there, love? And as she swings the door open, she is greeted to the site of a ruined apartment. There's trash everywhere from the party. There's a weed plant on the table in the center. There's hundreds of cigarettes all over the floor. And of course, things spilled all over the carpet and walls. And she's just standing there stunned. And then she looks down at the floor and sees little brown pellets at her feet. And she says, rabbit shite? My wee flat. What have they done to my wee flat? Then you can see her eyes kind of flash with anger. And she goes into the bedroom and opens the door and says, well, well, well. But John is passed out on the bed drunk, and he's kind of muttering to himself saying, mm, I'm 40, love. I'm an old man. And Kit answers him saying, Have you seen the state of this place, we lad? You're a freaking dead man. And that, my friends, is the end of the issue with Kit being mad at John for ruining her apartment with his party. And I know this one kind of seems like it didn't really have anything to do with the main storyline that's been going on in the last couple issues. But actually, I think this kind of builds some anticipation for the impending doom that John is feeling because he doesn't know what the first is planning. And we'll see what that is in the next couple issues. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And we will see you on the next one.